Welcome to our Hong Kong Brief Program. Today, we've got some fascinating stories lined up for you. First up, private equity firm PAG has raised $4 billion for its buyout fund, less than half of its initial target. The firm's chairman, Wei Jian Shan, chose not to limit exposure to China, unlike his rivals, which has led to more investment freedom in discounted Chinese assets. This strategy could potentially lead to lucrative returns if the capital markets reopen and valuations rise. Next, in a dramatic turn of events, New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon had to rely on a commercial airline to continue his trade mission after his official plane broke down in Papua New Guinea. This marks the second time in three months that the PM has had to switch to a commercial flight due to maintenance issues with the Defence Force plane. Lastly, Hong Kong International Airport had to close its north runway after a cargo plane burst a tire during an emergency return. The incident caused delays, and passengers were urged to check for updates on their flights. Please stay tuned for more details on these stories and other news highlights. Reuters Breaking Views, Wei Jian Shan, a prominent China dealmaker, managed to raise $4 billion for PAG's buyout fund, falling short of the original target due to his refusal to limit exposure to China. This decision has deterred U.S. pension funds, pressured by Washington to curtail investments in China. Despite this, Shan's strategy allows him to capitalize on undervalued Chinese assets, potentially yielding significant returns. Unlike competitors who shifted focus away from China, PAG's deep knowledge of the Chinese market positions it well to exploit current low valuations. For instance, PAG led a consortium in acquiring the shopping mall management business of Dali and Wanda for $8.4 billion. With Chinese asset valuations at a low, Sean sees the country as a buyer's market, contrasting with rivals who face rising acquisition costs in India and Japan. However, investors like Sean must navigate exit challenges, as Hong Kong struggles with large IPOs and Western skepticism towards China-linked deals. Nonetheless, if capital markets improve, these investments could prove highly profitable. South China Morning Post On Monday morning, Hong Kong Airport had to shut down its north runway after a cargo plane burst a tire during an emergency return. The incident occurred around 7.30 a.m., and the reason for the emergency return was not immediately clear. The airport authority announced that the north runway would be non-operational for several hours, forcing the airport to rely solely on the south runway. This disruption prompted the authority to advise travelers to check for flight updates, anticipating delays for morning departures. The incident underscores the critical nature of runway availability and the cascading impact on flight schedules and airport operations. Guardian, Air New Zealand came to the rescue of Prime Minister Christopher Luxon's trade mission to Japan after the official plane broke down in Papua New Guinea. Luxon and his delegation, including Trade Minister Todd McClay and numerous business leaders, were stranded due to blown fuses on the NZDF Boeing 757. Luxon managed to continue his journey to Tokyo on a commercial flight via Hong Kong, but 50 others had to stay overnight in Port Moresby. This marks the second time in three months that Luxon had to switch to commercial flights due to aircraft issues. Defense Minister Judith Collins noted the plane could only manage a short flight to Brisbane, prompting Air New Zealand to reroute a direct service to pick up the delegation. The recurring mechanical failures have sparked debates in New Zealand about the need to replace these aging planes, which are primarily used for defense but also serve the Prime Minister on trade missions. The planes are scheduled for replacement by 2028, but a defense capability review might push for an earlier upgrade. South China Morning Post, Hong Kong has made significant strides in promoting gender diversity on corporate boards, with the number of companies with all-male boards having since the introduction of a new rule two years ago. Bonnie Chan Yiting, the first woman to lead the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, HKEX, highlighted this progress in her first media interview since taking the top post. 
The rule mandates that all companies listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange must have at least one woman on their boards by the end of the year. Currently, only 17% of listed companies lack female directors, a notable improvement from 40% in 2022. Chan emphasized that diversity, whether gender or otherwise, enriches boardroom discussions with diverse perspectives. Despite the progress, Hong Kong still lags behind countries like Norway, where at least 40% of either gender must be represented on boards. Chan believes ongoing corporate governance improvements are essential to maintaining the local stock market's appeal to international investors. HKX is also seeking feedback on a plan to limit independent directorships to a maximum of six per person, with each tenure capped at nine years. South China Morning Post, Menzies Aviation, one of the world's largest aviation services companies, aims to triple its presence in mainland China following its expansion in Hong Kong. CEO Philip Joannig revealed that the UK-based company plans to grow its footprint through customer demand and strategic investments. Menzies recently acquired a 50% stake in Jardine Aviation Services Group, now rebranded as Menzies CNAC Aviation Services, which provides a wide range of ground handling services at Hong Kong International Airport. The joint venture is now the second largest ground handling operator in Hong Kong, holding a 45% market share. Joannig is optimistic about the company's growth prospects, predicting robust business expansion in the coming years. He also emphasized the importance of staff training and attractive career packages to support the company's growth, especially with the upcoming launch of Hong Kong's third runway. Despite the expansion, Joannig assured that there are no plans to increase ground handling charges, emphasizing a commitment to maintaining current price structures. CNN, in China, a centuries-old skirt design known as the Mamiankan or horseface skirt is experiencing a resurgence among young people, who are giving it a modern twist with unconventional pairings and fabrics. This trend is part of a broader movement called Zin's Hongxi or New Chinese Style, which combines contemporary design with traditional Chinese aesthetics. This style has become a lucrative market, with the China National Textile and Apparel Council estimating its market size at nearly $138 million in 2023. On social media platforms like Weibo and Zaya Hongshu, searches for new Chinese style have surged, reflecting a growing interest among young people in using traditional culture to express their attitudes. Fashion designers like Samuel Gui Yang and Ian Hilton are also riding this wave, drawing inspiration from Chinese heritage to create modern, culturally rich designs. Despite some criticisms of commercialization and the quality of mass-produced items, the trend continues to gain momentum, inviting more people globally to appreciate Chinese culture through fashion. South China Morning Post, Hong Kong's government has expressed deep concern over a series of power outages orchestrated by CLP Power, the city's primary electricity provider for Kowloon, the New Territories, and outlying islands. The latest incident left 2,250 households in Wong Tai Sin without power for over four hours, prompting Secretary for Environment and Ecology Tse Chin Wan to demand a detailed report and a comprehensive review of all outages over the past three years. The government is also considering establishing an independent regulatory agency to oversee the power companies, as the current scheme of control agreements, SCAs, which have been in place since 1964, may no longer be sufficient. The repeated failures have raised public concerns about the reliability and safety of the electricity supply, especially in a city with numerous high-rise buildings. CNN a new high-speed sleeper train service now connects Hong Kong with Beijing and Shanghai, significantly reducing travel times compared to previous overnight routes. Launched on June 15, the service features two overnight routes departing from Hong Kong West Kowloon Station and arriving in Beijing and Shanghai the following morning. The trains run four days a week and offer various seating options, including second-class seats, standard sleepers, and deluxe sleepers. 
Despite being slower than the daytime bullet trains, the sleeper service is ideal for business travelers needing to arrive refreshed and for tourists looking to save on accommodation costs. The service also features a joint immigration checkpoint at West Kowloon Station, simplifying border crossing procedures. However, travelers still need valid China visas or travel documents. The high-speed railway, part of the larger guangzhou shenzhen Kong Express Rail Link, has faced controversy over its cost, speed limitations, and political implications but remains a popular alternative to air travel. The independent, Broadway fans were treated to a surprise performance at the Tony Awards when Jay-Z joined Alicia Keys on stage to sing their hit Empire State of Mind. The performance, part of Keys' musical Hell's Kitchen, brought the New York City crowd to its feet and garnered praise on social media. The Tony Awards, hosted by Ariana DeBose, featured several musical numbers, including a performance by the cast of The Who's Tommy with original band member Pete Townsend. While DeBose's hosting received mixed reactions, the show's musical performances, especially the Jay-Z and Alicia Keys duet, were highlights of the evening. The surprise appearance by Jay-Z was seen as a significant boost for Hell's Kitchen, which was nominated for Best Musical alongside other contenders like Illinois, The Outsiders, Suffs, and Water for Elephants. Guardian China's premier, Li Chang, visited Australia, starting his trip at the Adelaide Zoo, which houses pandas Wang Wang and Fu and I. This visit is part of China's panda diplomacy, where pandas are loaned to countries based on diplomatic relations. However, these pandas symbolize more than just friendship, they are a reminder of China's colonial history in Tibet. Despite Australia's history with its indigenous community, Australian officials are unlikely to confront China on these issues or the treatment of Uyghurs. Instead, Australia prioritizes trade, even though China has bullied Australia economically by targeting exports like wine and lobsters. The case of Chinese-Australian writer Yang Hingjuan, who received a suspended death sentence from a Beijing court, highlights the Australian government's inadequate response. Chinese Australians, like the artist Badi Yuko, feel unsafe and believe the government should take a stronger stand against China's authoritarianism. Badi Yuko's political cartoon of Anthony Albanese juggling wine exports and defence strategies underscores the unsustainable and dangerous nature of Australia's current approach to China. South China Morning Post Professor Yuan Kwok Young a leading infectious disease expert from Hong Kong, shares his journey in his upcoming autobiography, My Life in Medicine, A Hong Kong Journey. The book, set to be published in mid-July, covers his life from childhood to his role as a government advisor during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yuan, who chairs the Infectious Diseases Department at the University of Hong Kong, found writing the book therapeutic as he nears retirement. Inspired by his grandfather, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, Yuan initially wanted to be an astronaut or a veterinary surgeon but eventually pursued medicine. His experiences with animals and astronomy shaped his approach to microbiology. Yuan's book also recounts his contributions to public health crises like the SARS outbreak in 2003 and the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite facing criticism and death threats, Yuan remains committed to speaking out on important issues. He plans to stay in Hong Kong unless his personal safety is threatened, expressing pride in his contributions to the city during challenging times. South China Morning Post Eduardo Brazao, a Portuguese consul general and historian, founded the Instituto Português de Hong Kong in the late 1940s to celebrate Portuguese culture in Hong Kong. Despite his efforts, the institute petered out by the early 1950s. Brazau, born in Lisbon in 1907, was a distinguished diplomat and a member of various historical academies. He arrived in Hong Kong in 1946 and found a large Portuguese community but struggled to engage them in cultural initiatives. His monograph, Portugal and England in China, highlighted his views on cultural connections. 
however, most local Portuguese were indifferent to his efforts due to the harsh realities of post-war Hong Kong. Disillusioned, Brazau left Hong Kong in 1951, describing his time there as five years of struggles in a terrible climate. Despite this, his promotion of Portuguese culture had some lasting impacts, such as the establishment of Escola Camões in 1954. Brazau died in Cascais, Portugal, in 1987, having left a mixed legacy in Hong Kong. South China Morning Post China volleyball legend Lang Ping has expressed concerns about the Chinese women's volleyball team's chances at the Paris Olympics, citing their inconsistency as a potential downfall in a highly competitive tournament. During the Nations League in Hong Kong, China secured both Olympic qualification and a spot in the league season finals, highlighted by a remarkable comeback against world number one Turkey. Despite their improvement in Hong Kong, where they remained unbeaten, their previous poor performance in Macau had put their Olympic spot at risk and led to calls for head coach Kai Bin's resignation. Lang, who has won Olympic gold both as a player and coach, emphasized the importance of star spiker Zhu Ting, who was sidelined due to injury but has been playing for her club in Italy. Lang criticized Kai for not giving Zhu enough playtime to reconnect with the team, stressing that Zhu's experience and consistency are crucial, even if her scoring has decreased due to injuries. The team's fans have mixed feelings, with some crediting other coaches for recent successes and others optimistic about Kai finding his rhythm. The players remain committed to fighting for Kai and aim to give their best at the upcoming games. South China Morning Post Bonnie Chan E. Ting, CEO of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, HKEX, has praised the resilience of Hong Kong's IPO market, which has shown significant recovery since April. The exchange is currently vetting around 110 listing applications, with a notable surge in new IPO submissions following measures introduced by the China Securities Regulatory Commission, CSRC, to support fundraising in Hong Kong. The Hang Seng Index rose 11% in Chan's first 100 days, and average daily turnover increased by 35%. Since April, 18 IPOs have raised 8.7 billion Hong Kong dollars, a substantial rise from the earlier months. Chan, who has a legal background and has been with HKEX since 2007, aims to ensure the exchange remains resilient and adaptable to changes in the financial environment. She has initiated the development of the Orion Derivatives Platform for Global Around the Clock Trading, set to launch in 2028. Chan also focuses on green financial and carbon credit trading platforms to bolster Hong Kong's position as a green financing hub. She emphasizes leveraging Kex's strong connection with mainland China, which accounts for 80% of daily traded shares, to attract more Chinese and international listings and investors. The recent successful listing of Quantum Farm under the new Chapter 18C framework for tech pioneers exemplifies Kex's strategy to create tailored listing frameworks for innovative companies. South China Morning Post Olympic swimmer Stephanie Ohoishan announced her retirement from her signature 100-meter backstroke event in Hong Kong through an emotional Instagram post. Competing at the Long Course Swimming Invitational Trial, the city's final Olympic qualifying meet, the 32-year-old won her last race in 101 at the Hong Kong Sports Institute, outpacing Cindy Chung Samute. Although O has not qualified for an individual event at the Paris Olympics, she might still join Hong Kong's relay team. Reflecting on her journey, O shared how she spent the past two years in Australia focusing solely on training to achieve the Olympic qualifying time. Despite not reaching the one-minute mark needed for Paris, she expressed no regrets about her intense dedication to the sport. O first represented Hong Kong at the 2008 Beijing Olympics at age 16 and has since competed in three more games, earning eight Asian Games medals. Fellow Hong Kong swimmer Siobhan Hahi, Cindy Chung, and Ian Ho Yen Tu have already secured their spots for Paris. 
While Ho and Hahi skip the final Hong Kong trials, they will compete in Italy's Olympic qualifying event, the Set Kali Trophy, in Rome. Thank you for tuning in. The content above showcases the latest briefing reports and analytical synopses, thoughtfully curated by the Six Do team. These insights stem from a wide array of reputable media outlets, think tanks, government sources, and specialized experts worldwide. We encourage you to explore these sources for a comprehensive perspective. Keep in mind that while the content may not always align with the official standpoint of 6 Do Brief, it's not meant to be taken as absolute directives for decision-making. Comprising seasoned media professionals, learned scholars, and accomplished scientists, the 6 Do team embodies a trailblazing, fully independent media entity. To customize 6 Do Brief to meet your professional needs, you have the option to subscribe to a diverse array of briefings on our website, 6 dobriefcom Regardless of your location, you can conveniently receive 6 Do Brief via email. News breaks, buzz the ground, stories spit, walls come down, voices merge in the sound, faces mix in the crowd. Broadcasters paint the scene, world events on our screen. Every link a different theme, words collide in the stream. Six degrees connect the dots, background stories for the nuts. Hear the voices rise a lot, truth unveils in every spot. Cultures clash across the globe. of gray, every story finds its way.